Dear patrons, as a child who went to a Christian school, I learned that St. James was indeed great. As one of the 12 disciples, John the Apostle's brother, and the patron saint of Spain, let's just say that it was a life that was well lived. The St. James that we're going to be talking about today is focused on another revelation, finding gold in the historically rich Yukon Territory. St. James Gold, ticker Lord on the TSX and LRDJF on the OTC, is a Canadian gold miner that is focused on exploring, finding, drilling, and mining the thing in my eyes that will always be more valuable than any cryptocurrency past or present right here. The company currently holds both an option to acquire a 100% interest in 29 claims covering nearly 1,800 acres in the Gander Gold District and an option to acquire 100% interest in 28 claims covering 1,730 acres in central Newfoundland adjacent to Marathon Gold's Valentine Lake property. St. James recently announced an option and JV agreement effective on April 1st to acquire up to 100% interest in the Florin Gold Project covering nearly 22,000 acres in the historic Tintina Gold Belt in the Yukon Territory. The stock has been on a biblical tear since last year, and with recent news announcements, has caught the attention of LD Micro's investment community. Joining us on the call to discuss what makes St. James Gold so special and to chat about recent developments, it is my pleasure to welcome the CEO, Mr. George Drazenovic. George, thank you again for your time and energy today. The floor is now yours. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Um, we have an asset in the Yukon um, that has been privately held for the past five or so years, Chris. Um, we just recently announced a resource of 43101 technical report that outlines an inferred uh, resource of 2.5 million ounces. Okay. Um, to put that in perspective, that represents on this map less than 1% of the total land package of our Florin Gold property. We've drilled 17,000 acres in total to get to this resource. Put that in context. Um, comparable projects to the right of us, uh, on right of you on your screen, the Brewery Creek Deposit and the Victoria Gold uh, Eagle, Eagle, uh, Eagle Mine, they've drilled about 300,000 and 1 million meters of drilling respectively. So we're excited about the resource. We're excited about the expansion of the resource we have geochemical, geophysical um, um, characteristics that, that suggest the interpretation of our host rock is in excess of 10 cubic kilometers. Again, put that in perspective, the resource area on our map, you can see these drill sites on the left of your screen represent less than one tenth of 1% of the host rock uh, of our fluorine gold project. So we're very excited about this. I'm going to go to a screen here to give you a little bit of detail and clarity on our asset. If you're if you're into geophysics and uh, and and and, uh, and the detail, you'll note here that these there's a, there's several holes here. Uh, to date, we've we've drilled 61 holes in total. Not one hole has come up dry, and that's rare in the in the business of gold exploration. You'll note, for example, I'll draw your attention to ICE 10028, about two thirds of the way down. You'll note from surface to 526 meters, we have gold mineralization of 0.75 gram per ton material, okay? Right below that, the next row, we have um, in excess of 100 meters of 1.4 gram material. What this suggests is that mineralization starts from top to depth, right? That offers us the opportunity for a starter pit if the economics work. Uh, and that also reinforces uh, our, our interpretation that there is mineralization all over the mountain uh, and therefore expansion for uh, uh, opportunity for expansion. This slide uh, is, a, is, a, is a historical cross section. Essentially this red line is the depth of our pit. So we have a two and a half million ounce resource. It's up to 300 meters in depth. That's this red line. What you will note is below the red line is an orange blob. That is potentially higher grade material. In a nutshell, if we expand our, our lateral, uh, if our resource, if we expand our resource laterally by, by, um, by, by step out drilling, we can expand the pit, go to greater depth, 
and quite quickly in, increase our resource from two and a half to maybe four and five very quickly. So this is very exciting. The point here is there mineralization below our resource of which has not been captured in our two and a half million ounce deposit, or at least in a one, a 2.5 million inferred resource. This diagram outlines some geophysics. You can see in the white outline, that is our inferred resource. That's our two and a half million inferred resource. You will note there are three circles here. What that represents are high priority, high grade targets. To give you a sense of the scope of this, this target, this host rock, which I alluded to of in excess of 10 cubic kilometers, the, the outline represents 900 meters by 300 meters in scale and it goes to 300 meters in depth. This target area, to give you a scope, is about five kilometers by two and a half kilometers uh, wide, and also a thousand kilometers deep, as proven by, geophysic, by the geophysics. What that again highlights is the massive potential and scale of this project. So yes, we have a two and a half million ounce resource. We can expand that quite quickly by step out drilling and going to depth. Uh, but more so, we have these high priority targets, which we believe are multiple deposits, additional deposits and discoveries on the mountain. You'll also know there, is, there are two black lines here. This black line that goes right through the resource is a Jethro Fault. And there is another control uh, uh, feature, control fault, called the Treadwell Fault. Where these two faults uh, occur, that's a target. So it's a high priority target with, uh, we believe, uh, the right conditions for additional gold discovery. Again, this, this diagram highlights the extent of the, of the geochem. Uh, geochem essentially is when um, a, a, um, a driller goes out in the field, takes a, takes a sample maybe upwards of five feet with auger, auger drills and samples every 25 meters uh, and they get tested. So what you see here is a Christmas tree of lights. The, this is a great signal for, um, for, 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 for additional drilling and possible resource. Again, this is, this is an example of having geochemical in addition to ge geological and geophysical interpretations that suggest that there are multiple discoveries on, on the mountain. This is also um, these magnetic and conductive models highlight, reinforce the actual scale of the Red Mountain. This deep blue goes from surface, which is 1600 meters in, in, um, above, above sea level, and it goes all the way down to zero, which is our sea level. Our surface level of the mountain in the Yukon is about 1200 feet. So this can give you an idea of the actual size of the host rock, which we believe is, is mineralized. Okay. Our Newfoundland properties are quite exciting. Uh, they're more grassroots, but they, they, uh, they neighbor two, two of the, the two largest discoveries in Newfoundland. One is the, the Newfound gold discovery. Uh, it's, uh, it was a result of their Keats Hole discovery in 2019. We're literally right beside them. And their other discovery in Newfoundland that has really set the, set the gold uh, business ablaze in, uh, in Atlantic Canada is a Marathon Gold deposit. We are also actually adjacent to Marathon Gold. Uh, the, the features of both these properties are, they are on these fault lines and these geological features, which are very fertile ground for gold exploration. Um, for example, on a Quinn Lake property, we are on what we call the Rogerson conglomerate, that's this orange ribbon, and also the Valentine Lake shear zone. These are geological features that run right through our property and they go right through Marathon's five discoveries, essentially, the Berry Zone, the Marathon Deposit, which is the, the iconic deposit in Newfoundland, uh, the Sprite Victory Deposits. All of these deposits that Marathon Gold has announced all fall a long trend with the Rochester Lake Conglomerate. And as you can see here, it goes right through our property. In fact, on the other side, there's a company that has just announced a two and three quarters million drilling program so we have activity all around us. So we have, I think, one of the most promising properties that, uh, that has not been on the market for years, uh, the Flowing Gold Project with immense upside. 
And I believe we also have some very exciting properties in Newfoundland. Again, one of the hottest prospects in, in really North America as well. And we're perfectly situated to take advantage of the activity there. Thank you. Well, George, thank you for the presentation. And um, all these questions are essentially my own as someone who has been a gold and silver bug for, I wanna say the last quarter century. Um, there's a lot of things that I look for when it comes to kind of assessing uh, investments in this category. But I think one of the most important things is to really talk about your history. Um, how did St. James uh, come along for, for you? Was it, was it just, you know, happenstance? Was it right place, right time? Uh, just kind of give me a little bit about the background of the, of the company and its rich history. Prior to joining St. James, I was a very active uh, entrepreneur, consultant, attract identifying properties in the gold space, the precious metals, even lithium, cobalt, vanadium. So I, I built up relationships with geologists throughout North America. This was a property that was on my radar for many, many years. Uh, it was just never available. Um, but when I saw the the, the, the ascension of the gold market turn and, and go from a bear to a bull market, I started to, be, to get very active as far as trying to source this asset. The vice president of St. James Gold, Dr. Stuart Jackson, he was intimately involved with this property, the Florin Gold property that is over a decade ago. So he knew it existed. Uh, the market didn't because it went private for over five years. The vendor of the property consolidated the property, did additional geochemical work, and just waited for the right opportunity and the right company to, to take it to the next level. So the goal here is we know we have a, a backstop of a two and a half million ounce resource. We know we can go deeper with the initial pitch shell and get a larger resource. Uh, and possibly get it to four to five million, which I, which we think is is feasible. But the real care, the real goal of this Florin project is to identify, is to drill the many multiple hotspots that have already been identified on the mountain. This project is about scale. This project has 22,000 acres, unencumbered, um, consolidated. It is all contiguous. And yet only one percent, less than 1% of the entire acreage has actually been drill tested. We also have reports from other engineering firms that suggest that these hotspots exi exist and they've actually put together a recommendation for drilling in the upcoming seasons. So this is essentially a follow-up. I think, I think experience and management is key in this aspect. Who kind of comprises uh, on, uh, of your team? and especially on the engineering and the mining uh, area. I mean, is there, is there, are these guys that have been essentially tried and tested over a 10, 20, 30, 40 year career? So Stuart Jackson, our lead vice president of exploration, he's a PhD, University of Alberta. He's been involved with several, intimately involved, not involved, he's been the lead in identifying multiple gold discoveries in the state of Washington, for example. He was also intimately involved in taking a grassroots Turnigan nickel project, uh, which is now uh, called Giga Metals. He took that project from grassroots to one over 1 billion tons. Uh, he has a history of identifying resources and, 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 uh, and deposits. We also have on our, on our board, we have an individual that ex is experienced in taking projects to the NASDAQ. That's possibly a goal of ours. If we get big enough and we find the results which we think could be there, um, we want to accelerate our growth as a company to more senior exchanges as well. So we put together uh, a, a diversified group of individuals that all have different skill sets, but we all have one goal in mind, and that's to find a massive discovery, um, many times more than two and a half million ounces, and to develop this ultimately to feasibility. So what are the internal milestones that you guys have in place for you and the team? Is there something that, you know, either investors or potential investors can look to as to kind of get either a roadmap or, or kind of a calendar as to uh, what you think you're going to achieve when? So we've been, we've, we've had several groups of vet provide us uh, their betting. We have an engineering firm that has provided a, us a roadmap of drilling and exploration. They've identified five hot spots, a very renowned, reputable engineering firm that is very, very uh, well, well uh, 
um, well aware of, of, of the engineering of the Yukon. They've identified five hotspots for us to go after. Our, our exploration program is budgeted approximately 20 million. We also have a 43101 that has suggested that we have should we should have exploration of about 23 million in the next couple of seasons. The goal is to use this budget to drill out our infant resource, grow it from two and a half million to in excess of four, maybe five million within the very short period of time, but more so drill these various hot spots and find additional discoveries. We know the mountain is mineralized. We know the geo geological expression, geochemical expressions suggest there are potential deposits here. As I alluded to earlier, we drilled 61 holes on the property, not we, uh, in originally in 2010, 2011, 61 holes were drilled. Every one of those hills, uh, holes encountered mineralization. And because this is a porphyry tombstone intrusive rock complex, we know that this is favorable for additional mineralization and deposits throughout the entire host rock. So you guys have some pretty big mining players next to you. What's kind of your philosophy with, with partnerships down the road? Uh, beside us, we have uh, Brewery Creek about 35 kilometers to the west. They've drilled approximately 300,000 meters of drilling. They have a, in, they have a resource of about 1.5 million. To put that into context, we have a two and a half million infrared resource and we've only drilled or the property has only encountered 17,000, one seven thousand uh, meters of drilling. To the east of us, we have Canada's newest gold mine. That's the Victoria Gold Mine. That's about 30 kilometers east of us. Um, there's, they just came into production. They're slated to produce about 200,000 ounces of gold per year for the next 10 years. We're in a hot spot as well, uh, right to the southwest of us. Um, there's a saddle deposit, which was developed by Kamenak. They drilled about 300,000 meters of drilling. That was bought out a few years ago by back then Gold Corp for an excess of half a billion dollars. So we're in the sweet spot. We're bracketed by activity. The only difference is we haven't done anything for the past five or six years. And we just all of a sudden came out of left field and now we're the new kid on the block. So uh, we're very excited to, to, to really you know, take the market by storm here. And then my final question, and then I'm going to ask, you know, a couple of a couple of fun questions as well. But my final investor question is the stock is basically quintupled within the last year. A lot of guys like me look at this and it's like, oh, well, you know, the horse has left the barn. You know, it's you know, the cat's out of the bag. This thing, this thing is kind of apexed. I mean, what's your philosophy in terms of what the valuation was a year ago? what the valuation currently is and what you think you guys need to do to go up another three to five X moving forward. Well, I, I take that as, as a compliment. Um, we have only 15 million shares outstanding. So one five, 15 million shares outstanding. You mentioned, I, or you asked me about some of the activity around us. Companies around us have 80, 90, 100 million plus shares outstanding. Right. So our structure, share structure is, is conducive for developing this project, um, you know, into the future to possibly a mine. So, you know, we have very few uh, shares outstanding, even on a diluted basis, it's less than 20 million shares outstanding. This gives us flexibility to finance at less dilutive stages as we proceed going forward. So, you know, if we started this company with 100 million shares outstanding at 10 cents, like several competitors in the Yukon are, I don't know if we'd be able to finance at a non-dilutive basis going forward. So our share structure is very tight. Our shareholders don't want to be selling. We see the long game here. We see the potential. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons our shares have been, you know, as strong as they have. Well, I got to tell you, my old boss at Meadowbrook Capital always told me that there was a direct correlation between shareholder return and number of shares outstanding. And the less you have, the more likely it was that you were going to make money on your investment. I also think there's an opportunity because we are at a strong valuation uh, at this early stage to acquire additional institutional support and financing. Uh, and that's going to give us greater strength as we move forward as well. George, can you tell me about the history of this company and what makes it so special? This asset hasn't been on the market for half a decade. Um, the original vendor of this asset was a high net worth individual. He drilled with his own money, about five to six million of his own money. He drilled, took an asset from grassroots with no resource, 
to 2 million, uh, 2 million ounces in two drilling seasons. When the gold market uh, corrected, this is uh, over a decade ago, it was very hard to finance projects. He took the company, um, he consolidated the acreage, he expanded the acreage, he continuously did work, but it was not on the market. It was not in the public markets for half a decade. He waited for the right opportunity. I had the relationships with, with, uh, with him and uh, people that have worked with him in the past. And because of the stress share structure of our, of our company, uh, because of the ability um, for us to raise capital, uh, and, and the fact that we have, um, that I have relationships with people that have worked with them in the past, uh, we believe that it now is the time to, to really drill and, and try to prove up this asset once and for all. It's been a decade in, in the making, Chris. It's been a decade in the making. This is not a project that has been in the market and people have seen it evolve. This is a project that has been in the dark, has not been in the market for many, many years. So George, let's talk about this. Are there any real comps that you have in relation to this discovery that St. James has? So every project has uh, an Achilles heel. Um, there's, there's, there's no real project that, that you can say has ticks all the boxes. Fort Knox is, uh, uh, Ross's Fort Knox mine, also in the Tintina belt, belt, they're producing gold at 0.37 grams material, right? Our resource has 0.45 grams material. Brewery Creek, uh, 30 kilometers or so to the west of us. Their resource is about one and a half million, uh, but they've drilled close to 300,000 meters of drilling. Victoria Gold, Canada's newest mine, they've drilled in oh, pretty close to a million meters of drilling, albeit some of it in infill. Their resource is about 3.3 million. Their grade is about 0.65, right? But they're, go they're, they're going to be producing about 200,000 ounces of gold for the next 10 years. So comparables, uh, every project will have, you know, maybe less scale, maybe more grams. Uh, what I do know is we have scale. We have the potential for, um, for developing this asset into a mine. Um, and that's something that is not readily said. I'll say this uh, last point. Um, if I asked you, Chris, and I said, I, I'm going to give you a blank check, but I want you to find an asset out there, start it from zero and bring it to two and a half million ounces. Nope. So, I mean, <laughs> can you find no, it, no, right? No, thanks. And, and if you can't, well, maybe how much money would you need? How much money do you need to find that asset to develop it? So the point is, you know, these types of projects, these unicorns, these comets that come out of left field, they, they, don't, they don't grow on trees, right? This was, yes, perhaps a circle of luck as well, but it's been a lot of work, a lot of relationships and a lot of timing. Um, and so this is a project that started from nothing to two and a half million, has not been on the market, has not been impacted by dirty sort of transactions with the majors. This is a virgin infant type property that already has two and a half million ounces and has a, as an order of magnitude multiple times uh, greater scale. Well, I was going to tell you, George, if you gave me a blank check, I would give that blank check right back. Okay, so... <laughs> Because because I would say it's it's practically impossible. The other thing I, I I I couldn't help but notice that you have a lot you have a bookshelf behind you, ah. and within this bookshelf you have a lot of books. And at one time before all this, I was a voracious reader. Can you give me you know um, can you give me one book that changed your life for the better? Um, so the reason I have books is I, I'm also a professor. I uh, teach the oh. MBA program. Yeah, I'm, I'm CFA, went to University of Notre Dame, a big Catholic school in South Bend, Indiana, did my, did my MBA there and ended up doing the Charter Financial Analyst, analyst designation and taught that for 10 years, part-time. Um, and I do teach at the local u university here, corporate finance. It's, it's an opportunity for me to, to really, um, you know, keep cutting edge and stay humble and, and really try to mentor the next, you know, uh, next generation of finance professionals. Um, but, but books, I will say my favorite book is uh, The Book of Wine, uh, because oh. I love drinking fantastic wines. Um, and one of the problems with this pandemic, is I can't go to Napa Valley and travel to, to the other sites of the world. But I would say The Book of Wine is one of my favorites. Well, I'll make you a promise. The next time you're in Napa, I will, I will drive because my wine drinking is, you know, it's not as, it, you know, it, let's just say that I, I dabble with it, but I can't really tell you the difference between, tell you the difference between two buck Chuck and Opus One, which is why 
you know, which is why people like me so much. They give yeah. me, they give me crap wine and they see me get excited and uh, they can say pretty much whatever. But I want to say that I didn't know that you were a professor. Tell me the number one financial mistake that most people make that, that is almost very hard to recover from. Um, we buy on emotion. Herd mentality, we buy on emotion. Um, and I, I started to my class last March when the class started and I said, which stocks would you pick? And nobody picked any stocks. People were terrified. This is when the Dow was at 18,000 points, late March. And I said, this is exactly when you should be investing, not, not running from the markets. And of course, six months later, the greatest bull market in the major stock exchanges in history. And I said, this is the greatest uh, opportunity of your generation. Um, and so I would say investors, in, uh, generally speaking, have this herd mentality. We follow the herd. Um, we invest in emotion. We invest in companies that we're familiar with, but good companies don't necessarily make good stocks. Of course. Now we're going to have some fun, you and I. Okay, the florin. Okay, I know you may not have shown it on your slide deck to our community. Yeah. I don't know if you have that, but tell me about the florin because I think it, it has a, a very unique history that may have been lost over the last, I want to say almost thousand years. Yeah, the, the florin, it's interesting. This is the time of the Medici's as well and in Florence and central Italy. Um, you know, we named the, this project Florin um, because it was for centuries, the world currency of choice. Yeah. Uh, especially for major trade. Um, so we, we wanted to, to, to brand this project, given that, you know, we, we want to be the next foreign as well. And, uh, you know, I do believe in the gold market. I alluded to earlier that I, I, I was involved in lithium, cobalt, aluminium. I'm very bullish on the battery, battery markets as well. Uh, but more so, I'm really bullish on the gold market. I think, you know, the macroeconomics of what this world is going through, what governments around the world are, 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 are spending, uh, is very conducive to hard assets uh, and gold being at the forefront of that. Well, I was going to tell you, George, for all, all the, our listeners, uh, Florence is my, or, or Florence is my favorite city in the world. Mm. And if anyone is watching television right now, they need to watch Stanley Tucci's Finding Italy because he spends a lot, a lot in this. And, and people will find out that Florence what at one time was basically the world capital when it came to finance and banking and business. A lot of the things that we kind of uh, hold for granted today uh, started in Florence a long time ago. Um, the other thing I want to discuss is obviously gold as an investment, because at least in the Lahiji household, gold and silver uh, are, are more valued than in this case, fiat currency. I don't have to give you, you know, all two trillion reasons why. But how do you see the price of gold, you know, uh, kind of, uh, how can I put this eloquently without making you give us a prediction? What do you foresee within gold prices as an operator yourself? Why is it that it is, uh, why it, it, accumulating gold is so much more expensive than the actual price printed? And then the, the, uh, the kind of cause and effect it has with with the new digital gold, which is cryptocurrency. Would love to kind of get your stance on all these things. It's interestingly, um, I believe gold is, uh, is, is, is a store of value. It's a store of real value. Uh, we see what's happening with the world right now here in Canada, our debt is increasing uh, more in one year than the entire um, previous 22 prime ministers of this country for over hundred years have accumulated. Uh, so that's going to have an impact. And we have a couple of choices for governments or governments do. You can increase interest rates or you can print money. And I don't see governments around the world, in Canada included, increasing or allowing interest rates to creep up or increase significantly, uh, which will result in bankruptcy, sovereign debt. So the only real alternative to, um, to maintaining these debt levels is to print money. And if you're going to print money, uh, gold is that hedge. Now, uh, Bitcoin. You know, it's fascinating. Bitcoin is, is also a quasi gold currency, I would say, but it has some different characteristics as well. So when, when things are good with Bitcoin, yes, the volatility plays in your favor. But it's a, it's, it's a fact that while gold and Bitcoin have similar characteristics, the volatility is something that is quite distinct. Uh, with, if gold corrects, 
Bitcoin is going to correct a lot more. And we saw that in the past year and a half or two, right? When Bitcoin corrected, it corrected significantly. I also think there's a trend towards uh, not just Bitcoin as a store of value, but they're going to have competition with Ethereum and other sorts of cryptocurrencies. So they're going to be fighting that entire space for a store of value. Gold really has no comparable. Well, I was going to tell you, George, and I'm very old school. If I can't wear it, I'm probably not interested. So it's, it's, I, I can totally understand the utility of cryptocurrency, and I think it's here to stay. That's my opinion. But in terms of tried and tested, you know, 2000 year bar charts, uh, I just feel that, you know, the, the guys before us kind of knew what they were doing too. And, and that value is ultimately going to express. And for anyone who has asked me, I still think that gold and silver are significantly undervalued in relation to all the other asset classes that one can choose from. Um, final, final question. Um, say I cryogenically freeze myself for the next thousand days, okay? And then you and I do another Zoom call. What will you tell me the uh, St. James Gold accomplished operationally as an entity? We're gonna drill the heck out of the mountain. We have a roadmap identified by a major engineering firm. We have a roadmap identified by an independent uh, geologist on the 43101. We've identified the roadmap. We've identified the hotspots. We're gonna be drilling for the next couple of seasons throughout the mountain. Um, I can't guarantee the grade, but what I can guarantee you is a potential scale of this project. Exploration is a risk, risk innate, uh, risky business, I get that. But we've also mitigate, mitigated these risks by developing geo, geophysical, geochemical, and geological interpretation. Um, we're gonna drill. We know gold is on the mountain. If we find grade, uh, we can very possibly be bought out in a couple of years. I, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm not saying we will. Um, but I think that is a real possibility given the scale of this asset and given as, as far, given, given the fact that, that so little has been drill tested to date, the upside is extraordinary. Well, for full disclosure purposes, I don't own any shares in the company, but I did want to make a trip up to, um, up to Canada. And you told me something that uh, I'm, I'm assuming some Americans um, do not know. How long does it take for you to go from Vancouver to your property in the Yukon? Well, it, it, it takes about a 20 hour car ride uh, on the highway. Uh, but I will say it took many, many days over 100 years ago. If you wanted to go to the Klondike, the Klondike Gold Rush, um, that city up there was one of the biggest cities west of Chicago, north of San Francisco 100 years ago. Um, where you know the gold rush was one of the biggest events of North American history. Um, it's 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 it was a bit it was a trek back then, but it's 20 hours nowadays. Look, as long as I don't have to bring my in-laws, I think I'm going to be okay for that 20-hour trip. But uh, but for uh, if you can't make it up in the meantime, where can investors go to find out more information on the company? You can go to our web website, St. James Gold Corp. You can ask for additional information um, on our email, on our website. We can, we can get you all the information if you require as well. George, thank you again for your time and energy today. And we will keep you, uh, we will be abreast with your situation and we'll follow up in uh, hopefully both in the short and long term. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time.